Hey, Cloud Native Austin. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> You're signed in with the wrong thing. Let's see if like, Zoom is actually working today. It kind of is. I, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I might. <laughs> I wish Zoom would let you more easily switch between accounts. That would be nice. You could just rename yourself in this meeting. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm gonna do that. It's cheating. Um, I want to see if, Amy, I can message you a couple of things. Um, or <laughs> if not, try to catch you after the call, mostly because um, I th um, uh, um, chatting through a few thoughts actually will probably explain part of my uh, uh, running around with my head cut off. Uh, thing. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, I know we've got some scheduling stuff coming up for for you all, um, and we've got like some basically some projects moving around. Is basically what it looks here. So yeah, happy to catch up. Nice. Nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do a little bit of housekeeping here. All right, I assume we're waiting more folks to be able to come on in. Yep, yeah, that's the that's the deal. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and out of curiosity, because I can't necessarily see this, who is presenting the uh, state of L seven protocols? We should we should put that into the doc, but he's about to speak up. Yeah. Hi, hey. John Barry here. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait for a few more folks people to come on in, and then we'll kind of work it out from there. Perfect. You know what? We're actually four minutes past so when this is all recorded, and I will go ahead and put this up on oh. um, the YouTube's afterwards. So, Jonathan, take it away. Awesome. Well, uh, this is my first SIG meeting, so thank you for having me, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present on what I've been working on. Um, I have a slide deck, and if we have questions, I am happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, but in, also during the talk, feel free to stop me uh, if anything uh, comes to mind. So let me, uh, if I can switch to screen share. Let's look at that. And then let's try. How does this look? Oh, good. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's my first time presenting, but I'm actually working on a proposal for the upcoming KubeCon. So, this is sort of a good forcing function to, to get ready for, for that if, if, if it happens. Um, but anyway, the, this topic is something I've been working on um, in my spare time. Uh, and it's out of um, interest and necessity for my startup that I'm working on. Uh, and it turned out to, that it could be useful for the community. So I've been trying to document what I've been learning and getting other folks to get involved. And really, this is about understanding how um, protocols that are not HTTP um, might uh, be implemented in the cloud native ecosystem and how applications and use cases that maybe are, are slightly not off on the happy path um, could more easily implement what they're trying to do. Um, so some background and, and uh, some pointers to the doc and some questions at the very end. So a bit about me, uh, I'm a product manager. I worked at companies like Google Nest for a bunch of years, startups and, and everything in between. Um, the company I'm working on is an IoT startup. Uh, we haven't launched yet. And uh, my background is in IoT and, and protocols and things of, of that sort. 
Um, and you can find me uh, afterwards uh, on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is Bear Bear Kicks. Kind of a boring, uh, lame name, but uh, funny story in, its own, in and of itself. Very very kicks. Yeah. So um, you get. I know. I, I I have to interject just to. I've got to hear the story. We gotta. It, it was uh, a long time ago. I think like eight years ago, and uh, we were coming up with Twitter handles. Um, and I kept on doing combinations. There's a very popular Twitter generator at the time, and it kept on coming up with Berry Berry, um, which is a you know immune deficiency or, or vitamin deficiency disease. Uh, and my coworker, it was in the morning, was eating cereal, and he was eating Berry Berry Kicks cereal. Uh, and and uh, yeah, it was it was a group vote, and that's how I got um, feeling about to Berry Berry Kicks. Yeah. I, I, I wonder, dude, that's about the only other context in which I've heard, you know, seeing, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It also depends on the age of the audience, uh, if, they, if, they, if they laugh or not at my, my Twitter handle. So it's quite <laughs> telling. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> anyway, I mentioned that uh, I'm working on an IoT platform. Um, and if you're not really familiar with the space, an IoT platform, um, you know, it's, it's, its fundamentals is trying to have a, a T, a thing that has I internet and you know, do something interesting and, and, and talk to the cloud. And that cloud infrastructure is doing a lot on behalf of, of that thing. Um, it's doing the communication between the device and the cloud and the cloud device or, or device messaging, security, firmware updates, uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. But for the context of networking, um, we really care about this, um, this device messaging component. And part of that is uh, related to IoT protocols. And so uh, IoT protocols, your networking protocols, uh, if you're not, you're not into the space, um, you may not know that there are tons of IoT protocols, and some might say too many, uh, but they have very specific applications and use cases and in different industries where they apply. Uh, they're generally designed around the, the local um, networking, so device-to-device -device communication, device-to-gateway communication, but many of them are, e are either cloud-friendly, so they, they talk to some backend or have some way to do it, um, or cloud-native um, in the context of they have definitions of how to talk to the cloud. Um, and, uh, and, and in part because they're uh, oftentimes IP based. So it's, it's really natural to integrate that with the cloud backend. And, uh, you know, this, this kind of brings me to what I'm working on, you know, as a platform, we want to support many protocols over time. And we want to do it in a way that scales so we don't have to, you know, hack different implementations and um, fake IP or, or do some um, protocol marshalling. So uh, to give you sort of how we are thinking about this problem um, and how we're coming into the cloud native space and why I call it the ecosystem is we're looking at it as, as sort of an iterative approach. So this very first architecture uh, we've built, uh, it looks something like this, right? You have the device again uh, on the left, it's talking over the internet um, to uh, the cloud um, that it's using one of these protocols, it's, it's co-op, it's an IETF standard, uh, it's a UDP based protocol. And uh, the interesting part is really our gateway, and that speaks um, um, co-op co on the other end. And within the, the cluster, it's forwarding basically IP packets around. That's very simplistic. It's really not cloud native at all. Um, this actually runs the exact same way on my local machine as it, as it does on a cluster, as it does in a VM. And this is what I would call not cloud native, right? And our goal is to incrementally add and leverage all the different um, components of this cloud native ecosystem over time. And the crux of it is, is around networking. Um, and so as we add more cloud native layers, we look at things like uh, proxies to get observability and um, marshaling and unmarshaling of, of so let's say security context, um, service to service communication and all the you know, capabilities of something like a service mesh. Because uh, as, a, as a platform, we're a single tenant today, single customer oriented, uh, but we want to be eventually multiple customers running multiple applications on the back end and eventually having those uh, backends talk to each other, different applications talk to each other, and ideally in the native protocol uh, that, that the device spoke. Um, and there's some benefits there of having native IoT protocols from device to, to, to the, the far edge or to the back end, um, but that's not so important for this context. And then, you know, the last part is uh, adding incrementally more capabilities, um, for example, like, like serverless. Uh, and this is just to frame how I've been thinking about the space and how we've been building to it and kind of how we've got to this, this survey that we've been, we've been working on. Um, it's not an all or nothing binary switch of becoming cloud native, um, but it's looking at the landscape of what we can leverage to build a new type of, of IoT platform. Um, cool. 
Uh, and if, if you're curious about any of these details, I'm happy to chat more about it later. Um, but for the context of this SIG, um, you know, we really took that first step would be to augment our gateway uh, with something like Envoy. And it was uh, about a year or so ago when we started looking into this, because um, one part of the gateway is effectively um, being a front end to figure out how to um, route those, those co-op messages. And so at the time, um, I raised an issue on, on Envoy um, to try to poke at this problem. This is really early thinking, and this content is actually in, in the, the survey as well. Um, because UDP was just being turned on in alpha on Envoy, and within the Envoy project, there were TCP protocols that were also supported. But by and large, HTTP was where a lot of the effort and capabilities um, were there. And, and I mean, that makes sense. And most of the customers who use Envoy are doing some sort of HTTP traffic and proxying that traffic. Excuse me. But the, my question I was raising to the group was, well, there's all these other use cases. We, I was just talking about M IoT and the different protocols and examples there. But there are other applications where you know, HTTP is not the right uh, networking choice, you know, for example, in gaming or telephony. Um, and so the question I raised was, what would it take or how would we enable people to implement their own protocols, their own L7-like protocols on top of Envoy that weren't HTTP, um, HTTP. And you know, what would that be like? Um, does it require just best practices? Is it modifying some of the accessibility? Um, this is before WASM, um, when proxy WASM was avail available. Um, <clears throat> is it a spec? Uh, or, or what would it take? And that began the rabbit hole of understanding this difference between L7 and HTTP as, as one category and, and kind of the, the bulk of the work um, that's already been done and, and everything else. Um, and so I came away with that Envoy, uh, looking at Envoy and talking to Matt um, uh, from, the, from the project that broadly speaking, cloud, the cloud native landscape is really optimized for HTTP. And, and that just makes sense, right? The majority of the workloads that the cloud serve are HTTP traffic, you know, web APIs and things like of that nature. Um, and as a result, though, uh, the projects in that landscape have a lot of assumptions around the, the traffic being HTTP-based and potentially areas where it's harder to implement non-HTTP-based protocols. Um, and you know, the, as I started thinking about MySpace and IoT, uh, I found other people who are looking to this exact same problem. Um, so I mentioned gaming earlier. Uh, gaming protocol, uh, gaming systems uh, use uh, you know, alternative protocols for game synchronization, for game chat and communication. Uh, and they're also trying to figure out how they could build gaming platforms on top of, of cloud native Kubernetes. So um, Project Agonis is, is one project from Google. It's open source. They also have a hosted version. Um, and it's for the game servers themselves. And um, uh, Mark uh, over uh, at Google was looking to build uh, a, a sync server on top of uh, Agonis. Um, looking into Envoy, and um, we both bumped into each other of, of trying to run a UDP-based protocol. Um, and there's really no good solution today. Uh, so they have a sample in, in their GitHub repo, and they, they're, they're, not, they're not trying to solve it right now. Um, another use case is telephony and real-time communication. Uh, and specifically, WebRTC comes up a bunch. Um, Pion is actually a, a set of services, libraries, open source a project um, for WebRTC and all the other lower bits that you need. It's actually a really cool project in, in Go. Um, and, and Sean, who's the lead over there, has also been thinking about the space a lot. Um, he's actually working on a document after we spoke of how to actually do WebRTC load balancing and how would that look like in, you know, in a, in a, on top of Kubernetes. Um, and that's super challenging, and we hope to get some use cases out of that. But you know, this, this made me feel that there's an opportunity to not just try to solve a very specific problem um, around networking and IoT, but uh, hopefully create uh, best practices and rise the tide for more, more broadly uh, the community. Um, so, oh, I got... Jonathan, I got uh, uh, distracted for a moment. Back on the, the first, it was it Argonis? Yeah, yeah. Um, can you, um, could you speak to that one one more time? That I got... Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm far from an expert, but uh, and, uh, it's, it's basically, uh, extending Kubernetes, right? It's, it's one of those projects that take the, the core APIs that are available and I think cost a lot of CRDs um, to manage the game servers uh, of, of your, your game backend. Um, so that's the serving of the game functionality. Now, 
um, and you know, scale up, scale down, and, and the very specific algorithms that game developers have de developed over, over time of, of scaling and routing and, and matchmaking um, and you know, leveraging that on top of Kubernetes. Uh, it's a really cool project. Um, what, and that's just you know, serve, serving, right? Uh, when it comes to the in-app services, so one in particular is game state synchronization. Uh, you need to be able to say, all right, you have two players, you're looking at a virtual world, you want to make sure that the, the characters are all in the same space and the, the bullets are all flying in at the same, same location. Um, so you build a game sync server. And those are pretty complicated to develop. And as an industry, they have a couple de facto protocols to synchronize the state of, of, the, of the virtual world. Um, they're largely based off UDP. Uh, there's no single one, but uh, they effectively do similar things. Um, serialize the data, synchronize it through some sort of synchronization system, um, and uh, you know, enable game developers to just pull in an API to, or library to, to do that. OK, uh, that, makes, yep, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and Google actually now is running this as a managed version as well, um, again, with just the, the game serving uh, component um, solved. OK. Hmm. Cool. Any other questions? I mean, in Python, it was the primary use case was focused around WebRTC. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, effectively re-implementing all the WebRTC functions uh, and protocols that uh, are needed to, to implement a client, a server, and um, even abstractions on top. So the, the, the most complete implementation of, of WebRTC comes from, from Chromium. Um, and so there's basically a rewrite from Go. But the, some of the harder parts were the protocols that WebRTC uses, because WebRTC um, and it's, it's a collection of, of specs. It uses a collection of protocols, some for the video uh, uh, streaming, some for the um, um, data channels, which is the, you can send, you know, say text data or other types of data on top of that, that pipe. It's based off of UDP, it's based off of TCP, it's based off of SCTP. So it's a pretty complicated suite of protocols. Um, and, and, you know, Pion has implemented those as, you know, standard um, Go, uh, Go, Go libraries. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, when it comes to uh, the sort of routing and load balancing and um, connections, WebRTC has similar problems and challenges that gaming has, which is similar in, in, to some IoT use cases. So, for example, when you're roaming, uh, the behavior of network traffic, uh, say on your cell phone or your, your connected scooter running around the Bay Area, um, to a player on a mobile phone, to a, uh, a device that might be hopping between um, different uh, base stations. You know, those kind of networking challenges um, are solved at the protocol layer and are very interesting and useful, uh, but also need to be integrated into your network management layer. Um, so for example, uh, if you want to do congestion control, right? Congestion control for that game server, I would imagine is fundamentally different than congestion control for uh, the, um, the WebRTC, and I, what I know more about is the congestion control for an IoT device that might be on a cellular link or a satellite link or an Ethernet link, um, you think about it um, slightly differently. So, was that helpful? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. And so this is kind of uh, really just background for this document I've been working on and somehow the screenshot got uh, down res, at least in my view. Um, and that's the link for anyone to go check it out. Um, what I effectively did was starting out with my own IoT use case and, and looking at that progression from simple um, ingress of, of data uh, from the IoT device to the, to the cluster um, over that IoT protocol. What are the pieces of Kubernetes that um, exist today that deal with protocols and um, deals with uh, non HTTP traffic? What's possible today? What's, what's in a cap or something else? Um, and then going through, okay, well, now, if I want to stand up a proxy like Envoy, what parts of Envoy assume HTTP or has already implemented capabilities of HTTP and, and so on. So the stock is this ongoing survey that I've been developing and uh, it's, it's actually been quite well. Um, I put you know, a week of worth of effort to understand each project is a, a better degree of detail, but more importantly, I was able to convince uh, some of the project leads and, and implementers from each one to comment in and, and, and validate what I'm saying and add more context and debate and discuss. Uh, how well each one is, is solving for. Um, so it took about a week just to kind of cover the basics of Kubernetes and Envoy and service meshes. Uh, 
then a lot of good feedback came from other folks around, oh, you should look at um, other aspects, like, for example, cloud events. How does cloud events think about uh, of, you know, transports and protocols? Um, how does uh, you know, the API server think about it? Is there something that they get touched with um, that? Um, how does encryption and security uh, assumptions work, um, and et cetera? So this is a living doc. Um, it's still flagged as draft, but it's, it's probably a little bit more. Um, than draft at this point. Um, and this is the reason why I wanted to share with this group. Um, and uh, just to, if someone doesn't have time to read this or hasn't read it just yet, I just want to give you a quick example of what kind of analysis I'm doing and others are helping me do and uh, sort of how I'm presenting it. So um, both the description and the takeaway. So this is the SMI spec. Uh, you know, it's a defining standard interface. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, the current focus is HTTP. The goal is to support more protocols. And so, for example, uh, there's this traffic specs, and you can add new traffic specs via CRD. So the takeaway for SMI is that it should be able to support alternative pro protocols, as it does already define uh, HTTP and TCP, and provides a traffic spec. As a corollary, there's some other parts uh, that don't have a way to extend in, uh, in a, a protocol agnostic way. So my, uh, my ask for the group is, um, if you're watching it now live or if you're watching it later, uh, please take a look at the doc. I would love um, comments, um, feedback, uh, any additional takeaways that I may not have uh, hit on or we haven't hit on yet, um, potentially new areas to investigate to, to really build out this as a, as a true landscape uh, survey um, to help everyone who's working on these projects. And I say specifically for the, for the SIG um, and why I asked to, to present uh, is, you know, where should I go with this doc? And um, I'm already engaging with individual projects and, and getting tons of feedback, but um, you know, uh, is this helpful for work that's being currently discussed or ideas that are, you know, kind of baking within the SIG? Um, you know, what's the best way to help, you know, enable this to be useful um, and engage with, with the SIG? I'm also very new to, to working with CNCF projects. Um, and if there's any other SIGs that I should be um, presenting to or sharing this information that might have interest or insights, um, that's, that's really, a, you know, how can I make this better and, and more helpful? Uh, yeah, and quick summary, um, I'm working on um, cloud native IoT infrastructure. Largely, um, I'm noticing that uh, cloud native is, is optimized for HTTP. Uh, are, sometimes um, alternative protocols are hard to implement. And there's a lot of different use cases from other folks beyond H IoT that might be interested in this. And uh, my goal is to really make it possible or at least easier to support uh, new protocols. Um, oh, and these slides are, are available uh, if you're interested. And uh, I want to say thank you. And uh, questions? Well, thanks for this, Jonathan. I, actually, I, this is uh, your, I would say, on a good path to engaging well, uh, you know, for the kind of, kind of our first time coming over to share. This is good. Um, I, I shared a link to the doc in the chat for those that, uh, that couldn't read the bit.ly URL uh, as quickly as that. Oh, yeah. The, um, I, I tried to make a custom slug. It's Alt L7 Signet. Uh, okay. um, a couple, a couple of random thoughts. Like, like actually, the, the example with respect to SMI supporting additional traffic. It's a timely discussion as there's an, kind of an, an active, uh, there's a, an active discussion happening on support for UDP. Mm, cool. Um, and yeah, the more service meshes that participate there the more um, each of them bring a little bit of a diverse use case for additional protocol support, as an example. Yep, yep, yep. Um, speaking of that, maybe I'll, I'll poke it at Ed for a moment and say, Ed, of um, with your NSM hat on, do, well, I get, well, here, I'm, I'm gonna maybe try to ask two questions at once, and that's that, Jonathan, of, of some of the protocols that you look at, have any of those been um, multicast use cases? The things like, you know, trying to get the right video? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think basically what, what Lee is trying to sort of set up as a softball pitch for me, um, which is appreciated, is that you know effectively when you when you talk about this stuff if you have things that want to think li live life at l7 and think at l7 right then by all means you should absolutely be going and figuring out how to get additional stuff into envoy and that kind of stuff but if you have things that literally have problems living that at l3 like multicast yep. 
uh, you should probably come and take a look at what Network Service Mesh may be able to offer you. Um, because you know, multicast is a super weird beast. Yeah. And um, not only is it a super weird beast, but, but it, it tends to be very domain isolated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you ever really, really want to, to, to get a room laughing, go to an Anog meeting and suggest uh, you know, the implementation of multi-service provider multicast, um, <laughs> they, will, they will either beat you senseless or laugh you off the stage, um, maybe both. Um, and so, you know, if you have things, and or if you have things that are more easily solvable down at that layer than they yeah. may be at an L7. Um, you know, but if you're looking for L7 intelligence, you're absolutely looking in the right place. But if you, if you actually have needs that live lower down in the stack than that, there are also answers coming for you. Yeah, I am. Yeah, thanks for, for the, the context. Uh, the NSM was actually pretty new to me. I just learned about it last week, so uh, I'm excited to... <laughs> To dig in further. Um, awesome. And I, I think that to, to Lee's earlier question, yes, there's definitely protocols that are, are multicast, um, you know, both on the RTC side as well as in the IoT side. And in my experience in, in working at, uh, for example, um, at Nest, uh, we used um, IPv6 multicast heavily, uh, but only on the local network. And that's largely because <laughs> you can't really go, you know, can't do IPv6 in most cloud providers. And you couldn't do IPv6, uh, multicast across uh, from from local well, to and, and this is this is where actually network service mesh gives you an interesting out because the way network service mesh thinks about the world is to say that we will allow you to connect to whatever kind of network service you want so at the granularity of a workload so if you have a workload that connects to a network service and that network service itself supports multicast even if that network service has workloads from all over the world if that network service is supporting multicast mm. then you can do multicast between those workloads wherever they may be and, and part of the reason this becomes tractable is the reason that you don't get multicast across the broader internet is because the nature of the way the, the routing state for multicast works just blows the, the, blows the doors off of one single global network, right? It's just, it's not going to work. But if you're operating on the scale of an application that has workloads in different places, that if you were to put them all into a single you know, data center, multicast would be reasonable, then you can make multicast reasonable for a network service that is servicing those workloads wherever they may be. Does that make sense? Yes, yes it does. Um, and so like that opens up some interesting doors in terms of how you might want to handle that stuff. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting possibility because you're not the only people who abuse multicast locally, not at all. Um, used, but, I, I, I would go so far as abused. Well, I mean, and the other thing is you could do, I don't know if you're familiar with beer. Uh, the not drink? the beverage. Okay, yeah, Not no. the tasty beverage. No, so like this is an attempt by some of the, uh, to make multicast more scalable. Not ah, scalable okay. enough the internet providers are ever gonna get on board, but more scalable than things like PIM, uh, okay. for example, yep, and yep, some of yep. its relatives, um, which scale very poorly. I, I actually, I have scars. I, I cut my teeth very early in my career uh, trying to do large scale testing of multicast and oh my God. Um, <laughs> So, um, but yeah, so anyway, like we would love to chat with you. You know, cool. go ahead yeah. and feel free to ping me. I'm on the CNCF Slack. We've got other people from that community here, like Nikolai, who are on the CNCF Slack. Oh, great, 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 great. Uh, there's a pound NSM channel and a pound NSM dev, and we've got weekly meetings and all the usual things. Cool. Yeah, definitely. This sounds like a great um, uh, way to extend this. Uh, when it comes to, you know, multicast is, is obviously a very complicated, gnarly problem. Uh, oh, yeah. There's, <laughs> There's other parts that are probably simpler when it comes to going beyond L7, right? Because most of these protocols um, live somewhere in between, uh, kind of hover around L4 uh, and, you know, use and abuse parts of, of L4. And, you know, one of the areas, just again, going back to IoT, is around, you know, congestion control, DDoS mitigation, all these other things that are, are not handled mm -hmm. by the L7 protocol. So there's probably some opportunity to also leverage and learn from, from how you guys are thinking about the, the problems. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, I mean, we're, 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 we're very much a complement to traditional application service mesh. Like if, if you need to understand higher layers, we're not going to do that for you. Right, right, right. Uh, lots of people do that really, really intelligently at this point. Um, but if your problem can be solved at lower layers, then man, we got, have we got solutions for you. Yeah. And I, I, my, my gut is, especially just kind of thinking about different implementations of these L7 protocols is there'll be, uh, a percentage of protocols that have to um, live in both worlds, right? There, there'll be, have mm -hmm. to be something um, around, for example, um, operators, how they think about uh, their, 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 you know, TCP UDP traffic and leverage some of the 
some of the service mesh stuff at that layer, as well as implement the high-level protocol with the assumption that 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 you know that's the network service mesh is, is available. Yeah, and, and, and like like one of the things we've actually looked at in network service mesh, we had a talk at NSM kind of about it, is taking a, a traditional application service mesh and running it on top of a network service, mm -hmm. so that you can get the particular kind of behavior that you need for your workloads over that. So for example, if you're deploying into a cluster that has already got a service mesh for the cluster, and it's not a service mesh that's going to support the magical things that you want, you would have a network, you know, a network, a network service that workloads, not only from that cluster, but other clusters could connect to, that does have a service mesh that is smart about the kinds of service meshy bits you need for IoT or gaming or whatever. Yeah. Because yeah. one of the things you're gonna, it's sort of the, we, we have this thing we talk about where we talk about don't weld the connectivity domain to the runtime domain. Okay. And it's because the things that are doing stuff in your runtime domain, whether that's a Kubernetes cluster or a data center network, they've got a wild variety of needs. Yeah. And trying to get one connectivity domain to service all of those needs, you can make it work for very common denominator needs. And the Kubernetes community has done that very well. But if, if you've got niche needs, the probability that you're going to convince your runtime to meet your niche needs without adversely impacting other people lower and yeah. even if it won't end, uh, adversely impact them there's a lot of discussion and work and blah 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 administratively to have it, make it happen yeah i mean um you know pre-orchestration and containers uh the majority of architectures for iot were literally separate domains and separate teams mm -hmm. right you have your device front end uh, suite of services that handle device communication and, and device management talks huh? over some sort of you know to a second uh effectively cluster but you know set of services managed by a different team so uh that makes tons of sense where you want to combine them, but also uh, let the people who focus on that part of the problem space have their own um, well, what, One of the things that's actually super interesting that we're figuring out is it turns out that one of the major advantages we have is actually has to do with administrative domains, not connectivity domains. Mm. In that, if you think about the world as a single administrative domain, possibly subdivided on a hierarchy tree, that works great if you're in a single organization. Um, but the minute you're not, where you've got two hierarchy trees of administrative control, that's where almost everything breaks down. And we're actually designing for that scenario. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, and also, I think, think of a lot of other use cases where it's not maybe um, multiple organizations, but some sort of compliance sensitive network versus non compliance sensitive network. Right, right. Because yeah, nobody wants to have the workloads running in their system that require them to have 15 layers of compliance checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's annoying. Yeah. Right. But if the compliance checks associate to the connectivity, then make them associate to the connectivity. Yes, and you know, uh, just another use case uh, to throw out there. Um, when it comes to um, carrier integrations, I, I threw a slide about that. Um, a lot of times, if you have a deep partnership with a carrier, they might actually deploy an application you know, in your in your environment um, that talks directly to their network, uh, and that has special requirements, uh, very complicated network uh, routing logic, and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, that may even be your code. No, absolutely. We, we, and we've had carriers um, give talks at NSMCon. Um, so there's definitely some interest there. There have been musings about how you could use network service mesh because it's sort of very simple mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an underlying architecture to say, okay, I actually want to ask my carrier to for something to connect this workload to that particular yeah. magic networking yeah. treatment for my carrier. Yeah. 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 Right. Just this workload, not my entire flipping data center because God knows. Yeah. And without having to like figure out which IP should be getting this special treatment game which always makes everyone miserable. Yep. Awesome, awesome. I definitely got to dig into um, network service mission and come to your next Yeah, let, let me know. If, if it helps you, I'm happy. And otherwise, all still good. Cool. Uh, any other questions, feedback? Hey, look at that. I only talked on mute for less than eight seconds. So that's, uh, <laughs> if you're unaware, there's some uh, implicit like uh, measurement of your own narcissism. If you, uh, you know, I, my, my perspective is if you go for over 30 seconds talking to yourself, it's, you're probably a narcissist. So, so we're, I'm all right today. Uh, uh, I in part uh, was doing what Ed was saying, which is sort of po poking at, at Ed, poking at um, kind of my point of my area, an area of interest for me around multicast. Um, given that uh, Matt is here as well, um, <clears throat> and just in context of, uh, let me ask an ignorant question, kind of in context of IoT and, and embedded devices. Um, Matt, the mobile library, the, the sort of the, the 
Envoy's mobile library or the mobile edition of Envoy, if I could um, characterize it like that. Is there a, is, Jonathan, is there like a tie-in here um, in terms of part of that, that focus? Probably not, um, just because most of the IoT devices are running on microprocessors and operating systems and constrained environments that it can't, it can't run Envoy. Um, now, over time, you know, for smart devices that are running Linux and are running application processors and like MCUs that actually am and can run Envoy, I, I think it's possible. Um, for a lot of the IoT devices, uh, you know, that are deployed today, it's not it's not really an option. Like most of those devices, they don't they don't have heaps, right? I mean, it's like they're they're very constrained, so. They can't use HTTP2, they can't use gRPC, like they're typically using very basic text protocols, like, or, you know, maybe basic binary ones or something like what, um, or, you know, different messaging protocols, but um, it tends to be really simple environments. So you know, like po possibly in the future, um, I, I think, I think there are cases where for more expensive, more complicated IoT devices, it will apply, um, but not, not all cases. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of interesting because there's this, you know, mobile devices and Envoy Mobile is very specific, right? Um, but there's these cases of where there is a capable device. Um, and so in an industrial um, context, they usually have an industrial controller that's running Linux. Uh, it's probably running Java, so it's got heaps of RAM, um, or in more recent, uh, non-industrial use cases. Um, I'll explain this. Uh, so a major uh, retailer, um, they have uh, refrigerators uh, all, all along their, um, in their facility uh, and they have IoT sensors on them to measure the temperature to make sure it's still operating correctly. And they have a mini cluster uh, on-prem. Um, it's like a single rack type of thing. Uh, and that also connects to the radio technology so they can sense all the devices and collect that data locally and then push it off back to their, their main uh, host solution. So that's also like an IoT gateway, um, but it's actually capable of running, you know, a full-fledged, you know, Kubernetes Envoy. Uh, so the, the interesting uh, sort of where would that line live? Um, will, it, will the use cases that make sense to have a gateway-like device, will they actually just be running a, a more traditional uh, Envoy Kubernetes deployment, or will actually be even more constrained because of deployability, cost, whatever. Um, uh, but but surely the end-to-end -end IP, um, there's a lot of value in in having it at, at you know Envoy at, at that sort of the cloud side and being aware of the protocol, being able to do telemetry and observability and, and whatever what not may, may come out of it. Okay. And and just kind of like to bring to bring it home. Um, the device drives the requirements of the cloud. That's, that's sort of uh, one of the things I've learned in my, in my career. So uh, if an IoT device has a very constrained requirements of what it can communicate, how it can, can communicate, well, you can't really change the constraints of, you know, a scooter driving around the city, but you can, you know, for example, um, you know, implement protocols on the cloud side to match to the, to the device side requirements. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I guess um, I had, it hadn't occurred to me until just a moment ago that I've been um, speaking with a, well, with a very large um, manufacturer of, um, uh, well, geez, with the um, parking meters mm -hmm. and a bunch of other style IoT devices for, or the various styles of those types of meters for um, airports, uh, parking lots, and the like. And, uh, and the, much of our conversation was about their potential use of a service mesh. I think that they were considering Istio in this case. And what it could, and what it could really do for them, or, or how it could improve some of their use cases. Um. The, um, the the other interesting bit about specifically IoT is that there's not necessarily one type of uh, network, um, or network transport, right? Um, it, probably in the sensor uh, use case, um, they have some sort of local sensor communication, some wireless protocol, um, and it connects eventually to some point to some aggregator. Uh, and that aggregator might translate that protocol into an IP-based protocol, or it might be an IP-based protocol already, so it's really just shuffling it. Um, but the 
the, the network that, that's managing the local communication might not be an IP-based network. So it might not have IP-based traffic routing and network management, um, but it could be. So you know, if, if you're a carrier, um, like we are talking about earlier, you actually might be managing your own IP network. And therefore, things like network service mesh make a ton of sense because all your tower to tower communication and device to, to tower communications over your own managed network. So um, one, one, other, one other quick thing, mm -hmm. you mentioned non IP networks and, and that sort of got me, you know, that, that, that raised my, my ears again, because there's a thing we don't talk about on network service mission very much because most people only care about IP. Yeah. Um, but we are actually payload agnostic hmm. in the sense that if you have any kind of a payload that can be broken up into frames of any sort, mm -hmm. And you have something that you are willing to stick it onto for transport. Mm -hmm. If it's moving remotely, we will do that for you. So for example, in addition to IP, we also support ethernet, mm -hmm. right? So if you come in as an ethernet frame, not because I think this is a good idea, mind you, I think most of the time the cloud needs ethernet like it needs a hole in the head, but there are a small number of, of pathological use cases where it actually is the thing you need. Um, now, and one of the reasons we kept that agnostic was specifically because even though we don't know enough about IoT to actually know what to do, we did know that IoT had a bunch of what we call exotic network protocols. Yes. yes. Where there, and, and so if you, what you're doing is just streaming a serial line where you don't have framing, that I probably can't help you with, yeah. right? But if what you have is some frame-based L2 protocol that was invented in the 1970s, and you want to go drop that into some kind of appropriate transport and send it on its way, um, that we can do for you in spades. Yeah, some of the um, extremely low bandwidth protocols, like you might start seeing in, in low Earth satellite communication, those are not IP based um, because yep. they don't have the bandwidth for an IP, even a compressed IP header. Um, yep. But they are trying to map uh, the protocol the, to create a framing protocol on top of it. So once it actually gets to a collector or an aggregator, it can do that translation pretty fast. Yeah, and, and, and by framing, what all I mean by framing literally is it doesn't even have to be a framing header. It's just I can't stream it. I can't stream it. I can't do this for an infinitely, a potentially yeah, yeah, infinitely sure. long thing. Sure. I have to. I can only do this for something that is going to have a defined length. Yep. Um, yeah. That's really what I mean by framing. It doesn't even have to have a header for all I care. Right. Uh, <laughs> then that's more aligned with some of these these more exotic protocols um, that are not IP based. They're they're dealing with the again yeah. may or may not solve your problem, but we at least tried to leave space for it. Yeah, no, that that uh, that opens up space for sure. Very good, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, all right, uh, other points of business. Well, yeah, I think you muted yourself again. I don't know how you did it. Was, it, was I speaking while muting? You were doing that again. Try it again. Wow. All right, good. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll share the meeting minutes um, here briefly. Um, both to, yeah, to, to. So, ne next up was a, so, so uh, sorry, uh, geez, I'm a bit all over the place. Um, thank you, Jonathan. We'll go ahead and, and maybe do a couple of things. You'd ask, like, hey, sort of, anybody have any feedback, any, any questions? We've had some good discussion. Um, are there other suggested next steps? And, and you know, uh, can this be useful to, to others beyond um, how it's been useful to some today? It looks like you've gotten some fairly decent engagement in the um, document that, you know, in the capturing the state of those uh, protocols with respect to various cloud native projects. Um, Maybe there's further discussion or other suggestions from folks on the call about that. Um, I think my the first one that I would suggest is that um, uh, is that there's a there's a presentations folder uh, within the SIG network uh, repo that um, can pr can provide some posterity to today's um, presentation and um, and and as a point of interest to those that are you know, those that might come along later and, and are interested. Uh, yeah, and I guess maybe I would say, you know, in lieu of anyone else suggesting something else is maybe Jonathan to do what you can to, to stick around, you might find opportunity to advance 
part of that effort in context of this, this SIG. Right now, are you having trouble getting people uh, to respond or, or um, different representatives of those projects to, to review the doc or to? Actually not. It's been surprisingly uh, amazing. Uh, just I post in an uh, appropriate um, Slack group or, or, or maybe on, on Twitter if they're not active there. And they just pop right in, add some comments. Um, some some project maintainers of competing projects are having little discussions, which is also fun. Um, but yeah, it's, I've been getting really good engagement so far. <laughs> nice. Okay. Huh. I mean, the, you know, one of the questions, you know, are there other SIGs? And it sounds like, you know, immediately the, the network service mesh is, is definitely one of those uh, areas where I, I need to go deeper in. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, uh, the other topic that we'd had for today was, um, well, well, actually, before we get to that, just with, with um, Nikolai here, I'll say um, kudos on your recent switch of role. So, um, and timely in terms of it being a topic that we will be discussing further. I bring this up to say congrats on the role change, also to hint toward, um, the notion that we're, we're working on schedules now for uh, trying to assign a, a slot for review of Kuma, presentation of Kuma and review. Thank you. And then um, I suppose you already know this, uh, Nikolai, but I, I think Ed had poked me on the side earlier just saying that you know, he, he was relieved that, you know, to finally be rid of you. And so uh, just, <laughs> okay, good. Good, everyone knows I'm joking, okay. The, the other topic here was a proposal around um, a sub working group, um, one focused on uh, performance management uh, in context of service meshes. Um, um, so now I'll, I'll bring up a couple of slides to maybe introduce the, the topics and things that we think uh, would be addressed within there. Uh, actually, on this, I'll ask Matt, do we, the, the, the working group for the universal data plane API, that, that's an ongoing active uh, thing? I, you know, I mean, yes and no, there's not too much activity right now. So I, I, I think there are aspirational goals. Uh, I think in practice, most of that work is probably going to happen, you know, iteratively in the context of the Envoy API. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. Well, of the, that, that, that helps. Anyway. Of the things um, to potentially work on in here are, um, is really something of acknowledgement that there's a couple of service mesh abstractions that have come forth um, because there are, we, we currently live in a world of, of many meshes. And so SMI was a topic we were just uh, talking on as a project to help standardize an interface uh, for service meshes running on Kubernetes. Um, recently, well, about a year ago, um, Hamlet had emerged as a specification for helping federate service catalogs across service meshes. Um, here in the last month, uh, Hamlet was presented in SMI's uh, regular meetings to explore the emerging of those two abstractions. Uh, for my part, I don't think that that will happen uh, based on a number of things and in part the response from the group there. There's another specification that's been um, worked on by a few different groups. Um, and it's part of what I'm hoping this service mesh performance working group can focus on and advance, maybe legitimize. And it's a service mesh performance specification. So it's a format for describing and capturing service mesh performance. Of the so that as a topic and a few other topics to chew through in that working group. Um, a few, a few things. So, so there have been ongoing conversations with um, the working group, the performance and scalability working group leads of, of Istio for some time about how to, how to capture, uh, how, to, how to describe 
an environment, how to describe a performance test, the configuration of a service mesh, and how to capture those results. And as such, we've been collaborating on what's essentially referred to as the service mesh performance specification and iterating on early versions. Um, we'd like to bring that, in, bring that into discussion within this working group to give it more air. Um, there are a couple of, there's, there's some older initiatives that have yet to be completed. Things like a, really a, a vendor neutral study of um, performance, uh, service mesh performance, data plane and control plane um, under a variety of configurations and to be done um, using the CNCF labs. And there was an, an approval to use, the, use that lab some time ago. There's been some recent um, interest in completing that research. Uh, and that's in part why the University of Texas and the University of Chicago, or University of Texas Austin rather, and Chicago, um, there's some postdocs and some pre-docs um, involved in some research here. Some of their research is fairly hardware centric um, and others of their research is just, it, one of them is, has just gotten done uh, doing performance benchmarking on um, search engines funded under a, a Google initiative. Anyway, lots of folks coming together from different projects. Um, it would be nice to uh, do that in this working group. Also, GSOC just landed and some projects were announced. One of those is uh, hopefully in collaboration with the Envoy Nighthawk team on bringing forth distributed performance testing. I actually consider that it's kind of an interesting thing that we're, we live in a distributed world today, or there are more and more workloads being designed in that way. Um, and yet, at least of things that I've seen, and, and maybe I'm, I'm ignorant here, and that is not a lot around it, distributed performance testing. Um, and so that's one, that's sort of the, the, the point of that particular GSOC project is to um, help enable Nighthawk to be, to run many instances of Nighthawk, have them be cognizant of one another and, you know, generate load from various vectors against various endpoints, coalesce that performance information. Um, lastly, the, another thing to potentially um, dis be discussed within that working group is and the notion that as the that service mesh performance specification comes forth that um, each of the service mesh projects that I've spoken to save for Kuma actually Nikolai um, when I'd spoken with uh, boy I forget um, Conco, Marco. yeah Marco a couple couple of times now he didn't necessarily, and it's okay, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm just giving context since you're here. I think he, he was uh, the only one that maybe didn't bite, but the rest of the service meshes that you could prattle off your tongue were really interested in. Um, sort of once this specific specification is formed, it's sort of running that, um, um, each of them consistently running some of the same tests such that there's, um, becomes something of a, maybe a, a mesh mark. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a few ideas in here that this, this group and these folks that have been um, collaborating for a while have, have been stewing on. And, and that's just the, the ability to um, provide, in this particular case for a mesh mark, like that's the, the ability to, not the ability, but rather a gauge and a scale for identifying the score, the performance score of a given service mesh deployment. Um, considering all of its variables, of which there are many, between the mesh's config, the mesh's version, all of what it's you know all of what it's doing, all of what's being asked for, which is really the value that it's providing, in and and being able to enable people with an easily understood gauge that could help them weigh the value that they're getting out of their mesh versus the overhead or the performance that it's providing sort of the cost of the mesh versus the value of it. And um, there's some kind of prior art in this context. If folks are 
and I, and I don't know that many would be, but if, if people are familiar with app decks um, from the days of old, I guess, uh, there's a, a, a simple formula for calculating the, the basically the, the performance of an application, sort of, sort of universally. This is probably a lesser known um, application performance index. We were part of what that group was thinking is that there might be a service mesh performance index, a mesh dex or a mesh mark. Um, and so, so anyway, I'm just uh, saying, hey, th these are kind of topics and things that to explore within that working group and kind of that's, that's the, the reason why we were proposing that there would be one. Comments on, on those initiatives. Um, so not, a, not really about uh, white papering things here, but rather uh, some, some of the artifacts to be produced um, you know, may, may include publication of a benchmark, a one-time analysis, uh, potentially publication of something of a, a specification for uniformly uh, capturing and measuring those environments, potentially um, an easy gauge, an easy, you know, zero to 100 number that you would use to identify uh, the performance of, like I said, the kind of the performance of the mesh in context of the value that's provided. Yep, and yeah, so, so yeah, so the, I, we figured uh, the, the reason that I was bringing this forth right now is because both GSOC and Community Bridge are landing in terms of the selection of some of their projects. And um, so some of those projects are very relevant. So. so when you say service mesh performance, how much of this is actually measuring the performance of the proxy itself? I mean, in the end, isn't it just going to be Envoy versus uh, everything else that exists out there in the other meshes? It, um, um, in this case, the, the spec, is, it, it can, uh, the, the spec allows for that, um, the, but the, what the spec also captures is what the control plane is, maybe what functionality is enabled in the control plane. So I think the, like as you were to run two tests and contrast them, if the only thing, the only variable that has changed between those environment configurations is your data plane, in that sense, it could be a comparison between uh, proxies, but the but doesn't necessarily need to be. If you if you leave the same proxy config and the same type of proxy across tests, then maybe the thing that you're measuring is just maybe it's the control plane. Maybe it's how much um, how much is distributed tracing costing me, or rather, is sampling at 100%? Even though I think I really need that. Is it worth it to me given the performance overhead? And, and it may well be, um, but it's to help people, given that there are so many variables in like understanding, understanding the overhead of uh, what a mesh, um, the overhead of a mesh, uh, people get lost in. I think a lot of times people will, not I think, like I've, I've seen it any number of times, uh, people will, uh, take a gasp at just how much overhead they're seeing from a mesh, not realizing that all of the value that they're getting out of it, that if they were getting logging or tracing or observability or um, MTLS or you know traffic routing and things, if they were getting all of those things from a variety of different implementations and tools in the past, they couldn't really simply measure the overhead of all of that, the value that that infrastructure was providing, uh, they can now. The, the other thing I might suggest, because it's an, very analogous to a problem that's near and dear to my heart is, the first pass is, as you said, cost versus value. Um, but the second pass you might want to consider is compared to what? Meaning that a lot of what they're doing now is invisible to them because it's scattered. And so they can't see that. And the reason this comes to mind is it's analogous to something that I deal with with the VPP data plane for you know normal networking kinds of stuff, where people look at it and say, yeah, but if I run VPP, it's going to burn two core. And what they don't realize is that the kernel is burning five core to do the same amount of work with less throughput. 
because the kernel's of, you know, use of resources is invisible, oh, but the VVP's resources are highly visible to them. And so being able to figure out a way to capture some of that for comparison, because it may also turn out to be the case that in many cases they're like, oh, the service mesh is costing me X, but it's costing them half X. You know, you know, basically it's costing them two X to do it the way they're doing it now. And so it's actually a net gain, independent of, independent of the additional value. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. That's a great point, Ed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. We're, we're kind of at top of hour. Um, any any other comments on on this? Very good. Uh, we've only made people one minute late, potentially two, to their next meeting. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think, uh, Jonathan, for you, we've got the links to the doc and the slides. So we'll look to get those uh, up in the SIG repo. Very good. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming today. We'll, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Cheers. Okay.